service here. We are doing this in partnership with uh, Turner County Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Their new pastor and his wife, uh, Tanner and Amanda, have arrived. And so we'll introduce you to them uh, this next week and we'll take part in that service. Our praise team is going to sing at least half hour. Good music, so come and do a little toe tapping. Just no dancing. We're reformed, remember that. And uh, we're just delighted to, to do that. So thinking about the fair, some of you are going, oh, I might have to walk too far or it's, it's this way. Folks, this year we're unveiling a new golf cart. And uh, we're thinking of getting one to hold eight to ten people. We thought, you know, do you have Harvey Jungling drive that? And we said, well, no. Uh, have you seen him drive? And then we thought, well, why don't we have Jerry Hagen do it? So uh, he started a new company, the Hagen Limo Service. And um, what we'll do is we'll have a second cart. We, we, yeah, we're just having difficulties trying to find a really responsible driver is what it is. So their name's not up there yet, but I'm having fun. Um, we'll pick you up. So park on the south side of Heritage, wherever it is that you park, uh, we will find you and we will bring you to the, uh, the, the center. So just encouraged by all of that and it's going to be fun. Consistory, we're going to meet, we're going to do some round table, just discussion, uh, RCA where we're together, uh, some things about the memorial funds, some things about where it is that we're at as a church and what do we look at, uh, recognizing some COVID issues and uh, children's ministries and all that stuff. So we're going to spend time in prayer, spend time in discussion. So Tuesday evening, congregation, you can be in prayer for us for that. So I'm going to ask the uh, team as they come up uh, to stand with us, um, recognizing again that we've gathered in this place, we've been prayed into as you do. We had a circle of prayer here already by nine this morning, and it's our hope, it's our heart's desire, it's our intention that every person here this morning, every person that's watching, that you would have an encounter with the living Christ. Wow. An encounter, an affirmation, perhaps a new step in your, in your walk with, uh, with Jesus. But as we're gathered in this place, grace and peace be ours in full abundance, for it comes to us from God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit at work within each and every one who calls Christ Lord. Thanks be to him. And so as we're gathered in this place, um, here's what we've got to do. We're still a little concerned about a Delta variant and all that kind of stuff, so stand up and just smile at people. Just, just knock them down with a good one. Go. Just knock them down. No touching. Just smiles.
Father, we want to tell you this morning how absolutely wonderful it is to be together, not only with your people, but the invitation for you or from you is to come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Wow, we need it. Whatever the week has held over this uh, past seven days, we recognize that we need to be kind of recalibrated. We need a tune-up. We need uh, some jet fuel put into the gas tank. We need, uh, we need just space to be, to recognize your love for us. And so for this incredible gift of each of us saying, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the place where God's people hang out Let's go to the place where Christ is at center. Let's go to the place where the Holy Spirit is constantly at work, calling people, encouraging people to run to the Father, to come and to sit at His feet, and to recognize His goodness, His faithfulness, to recognize the marvelous grace of our loving Lord. <laughs> so, Spirit of the living God, have your way. Do what you know needs to be done this morning in each life that's here. And we'll give you glory as we recognize you, as we see you, as we sense your being at work. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And be seated. And amen. Thank you, team. I'd love to have boys and girls and or young people at heart come on up to the front, if you would. So, Oh, good, good, good. Here they come. Austin, I'm missing your spider, uh, Spider-Man mask, man. <laughs> Ethan, you're good, good, good. Here, you can sit right on that step. Is that a good idea? Whoo! And as they continue to come, let me just remind uh, parents or grandparents, your child can sign up for the uh, reading, and it goes to... Labor Day weekend. Good. So we've got just a little more time. Everybody's got a spot. Good. Woohoo! All right, so what we got to do is we got to start by looking at the TV screen. Is that all right? So, can you tell me what these are? Trophies. Trophies, absolutely. Who has ever gotten a trophy? You guys got some trophies, yeah? yeah. James, well, what'd you get it for? Do you know? Um, baseball. baseball? Soccer? Yeah? Basketball. Oh, basketball? Well, we'll talk about that there. Yes. Wrestling, Ooh and soccer too. Oh, so can you tell me what these trophies are for? How do you know what the sport is? Because of the ball. So what do you think, Corbin? What's the one on the left, on that far side? Basketball. The one in the middle. Bowling and wrestling. Ooh, you're three for three. Good job. That's wrestling. That's right. So now let's see. What about this one? Tennis and hockey. Oh, and Pastor Mark, I just want to talk about hockey so much. It's the thing I just love doing, but I won't yet. Uh, but anyway, uh, well, and what about these? Baseball, baseball and? Baseball. Oh, well, I don't know if it's a ball. What do you think that guy's got in his hand? Hmm, what are you thinking? That is from the Rio de Janeiro Olympics in 2016. And people thought that they were giving away trophies to all of the athletes. But you know what it was? If you look really kind of cool at it, the thing that's around his neck, the medal, actually fits in there. It's a medal holder. And, of course, all of you as adults remember why they did that, right? Because Rio de Janeiro wanted to go green, remember, five years ago? And instead of giving flowers that would... Not last, they gave, good, just making sure, all right. Um, oh, here, I, I've got one here. 
This one is from 2003. I think Mr. Dwayne Smith, I think he was just born, and then he played baseball, and he got this one for the church, and then this one here, Lennox American Legion Post, fourth annual softball tournament, 2005. Who played for these? Oh, oh, we've got, yes. Isn't it amazing? And we kept them. We're auctioning them off right after the service, but look at those trophies. Are those kind of cool? So here's what I want to talk about. Let's just say that I got a trophy. Well, let's, let's say that I got this trophy here, right? So for baseball. What kinds of things do you have to do or know in order to play baseball? Yeah? You like to play baseball? You have to hit the ball. So you got to learn how to hit? What else you got to learn? You can bunt, you can hit, how to run the bases, you got to make sure you know that. What else, Jameson? Oh, you got to learn how to catch, Austin? Pitching and hitting and running, all the kinds of skills that you need, right? And let me think, what do you need to know kind of here in your head? Like, could I hit the ball and instead of running to first base, could I just go to third? That would be cheating, right? You need to know the rules, right? If there's a pop-up catch in the infield, or if the fly ball goes to the outfield, you got to know if it's an out or not. Hmm. Well, do you have to know about four balls and three strikes? Right? Those are all things you got to know. So not only do you have to learn some things, but you have to know the rules. Now, one more thing. Um, let's say that the team is going to play 12 games. And so um, I would like to be part of the team. And so what happens is I, I look and I say, oh, I'd like to get a trophy maybe at the end too. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to join the team and I'm going to play for one inning and then I'm never going to go again to any of the games. Do you think I would get the trophy at the end? Why not? Basically did nothing, right? You got to be part of the team. You got to show up. Yes. Ball over the fence is a home run. That's right. Ball over the fence is a home run. You've seen Pastor Mark play, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, I like that. <laughs> wow. So here's what we're saying, I guess, today. Pastor Mark's going to talk about the last part of our sports in the Bible series. We're going to talk about you've got to know the rules, you've got to learn some skills, and you've got to show up to be part of the team, right? I think that's awesome. So here's what I want to ask. If you could all stand up. Could you stand up? Right on the steps, right that's there. Oh, yeah. Miss Kathy, maybe you can come and help me for a second. Everybody stand up. Stand up. There you go. Here's what I've got. Oh, we're going to pretend for a moment that it's the Olympics. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Okay. Stand up. Now, congregation, here's what I'm asking. Two weeks ago, we said, how are you doing passing the baton, the baton of faith. Remember that? And I'm grateful that there's Sunday school and vacation Bible school, that there's family stuff. That's where it starts in your family, devotions and raising your kids. But here, as we're getting to the end of the Olympics, as we're getting to invest in the lives of these kids, I want you to cheer because they're all going to get a medal. So cheer, whistle, go. Woohoo! Stay right here. Wow. Put that on. Wow. Oh, one of them. Thank you. Put it right on. There you go. Excellent job. Look at that. So here's what we think. <laughs> bow, bow, bow down, bow down. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful job. This congregation loves you, and we know you love them. And we're delighted to be able to celebrate steps. Steps like how it is that you love Jesus, going public with your faith, perhaps joining the church, however it might be, but we want you to know that we love you and we celebrate you, all right? Thanks, and have a good morning. I'll see you back in the pew. Go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
All right, if the deacons can make sure that when you, uh, when you let Brian and Dwayne out at the end of the service, at least $25 from each of them for one of the trophies. So that's where we're at. Oh, look at that. So we want our kids to run the race, but they're not the only ones, right? How many times do we think, oh, they have all kinds of energy. Let them do it. No, it's us, old or young, old and young. And that's where we're going to go today. So things that we can pray into, think about as we create the space again to come to the Father, to sit at that throne of grace. So tomorrow morning here, service, our thanks again, the women of purpose. If I had a hat on today, I'd take it off to you 10 times. So thanks for all of the ministry you did yesterday and tomorrow. So um, yeah, be in prayer. Thanks for uplifting Gail with us this morning. And then we think of uh, the funeral yesterday for George Jungling and family that's here. Uh, we got to say about George yesterday, George was kind of a, a craftsman. He loved building, making things with wood. And uh, we talked about things that are George built. And then we talked about that mansion in glory. That's Jesus built. So John 14. So that's where we're at. So continue to lift up families as they uh, continue to work through and or as they grieve. Avis had surgery this past Wednesday, had a stent put in the leg that is uh, with a broken ankle so that it would increase circulation, hopefully, and help the healing. So she sends her greetings. Uh, Elaine moving the week after, so keep her in prayer. Uh, Elaine, 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 help me. Elaine, hell yeah. Uh, do you need help? <laughs> Let Terry do it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say you can call the deacons, but now that Terry, well, you can just let Terry do it. Good, good. Um, folks, we've got to have a little bit of fun. Um, everybody knows James Henry, and if you don't, consider yourself blessed. So, no, no, no. <laughs> James Henry, uh, he's kind of, you know, been delegating and or... Uh, selling some stuff off at the farm, but he gets this little thing that's got a, a little bucket on it, and either he thinks he's in the Daytona 500, or I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, this is the first problem. He's driving the tractor, Jan's picking up the stones to put in the bucket. Pitcher, wrong. Second, <laughs> he's in the tractor, she's putting a stone on, and she's completed her task. He needs to go backwards. Jan is in front of the tractor. He needs to go backwards. It's a new tractor. Did I tell you that? He goes forwards. Poor Jan. Fractured a bone in her knee. She's got a brace on. She's walking with a walker. Because he's so overcome with guilt, he's doing coffee this morning. He has all kinds of different flavored Oreos for everybody. Jan, Saint Jan, <laughs> we'll just drop it right there. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Verl had uh, uh, surgery, or not surgery, yes, surgery for his hands as well as a shot and injection in his eye for um, seeing, so continue to keep him in prayer. Luetta was in uh, Sanford for that infection, is moved to Luther Manor just so that she would be able to regain her strength, so keep her in prayer. First Baptist, I got to talk to the new interim pastor there, Jim Wold, and uh, we've invited him to come to our Tuesday meeting with the ministerial. Same thing with Pastor Tanner, and so they'll come and just excited how God's providing again for his bride in our community. Concerns, obviously, with the uh, Delta variant, praying to that, our, our governor, Christy Noem, our leaders uh, in our community, that God would move at the fair. Woohoo! Right? We're going, why did we say yes? I mean, is it convenient for the praise team to pick all this stuff up and to move it and get there early and we're going to have cookies and coffee at 10 and concert uh, 10.30 till 11 before the service starts? It's because we're hoping, right, that somebody would hear the speakers are on, the invitations will come. Our hope is that God would, would, would touch, be it a roadie, be it a, a fairgrounds worker, whatever it may be. And we want to show people the joy that we have in the Lord. So would you pray this week so that that service would be God-honoring and family-expanding? That's our, our desire. 
other things that you've brought, it's time for us to run to the Father. It's time for us to say, I'm going to sit in your presence. I want to pray. Let's do that together, shall we? I was glad when they said to me, Psalm 122, let's go. And we are glad that we are here and or that we're watching. We recognize, Lord, that some are in a hospital room, some are still in a living assisted uh, facility. There are folks who are just unable to connect. And, um, and so we're privileged as a church to be able to do this ministry online through DVDs, whatever it might be. We recognize, too, though, that this is not the be-all and the end-all. This is but the beginning. We get to continue to do what you've called us to do, to give cups of cold water in Jesus' name. Be that uh, making a phone call this week, lifting up our parishioners, our loved family members in prayer, sending a card, a bit of encouragement, or wishing them well health. Thank you, Lord. And then we think of the privilege that's ours to be able to say, uh, God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son, to save us. No matter what it is that's happening around the world, no matter what it is that's happening locally, be it a hailstorm in Sioux Falls, winds that come and tear through uh, Worthing and Davis and Hurley, no matter uh, the beauty of a day as we sit on a on a, on, a, on a tractor and cut the grass as we ponder and pick in a garden God we're mindful that we're always in your presence we're grateful that you give to us every breath so that we can breathe so that we can pray so that we can praise so that we can say as Karen played at the beginning we're so glad for that marvelous grace from you our loving Lord and Savior Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. We're forgiven. We're not burdened down with the weight of sin. We're, we don't have some albatross around our neck. We're not second-class uh, people. God, you don't see us that way. You see us with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ imputed to each of us. And for that, we are not only grateful today, we want to grow in that gratefulness and uh, we want to spend all of our days, 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, and still no less days to sing your praise. Wow. Until we breathe that final breath at the end of this race of life, I give you thanks, we give you thanks, that you have created uh, a praise team, you've created instrumentalists, you've created uh, folks that, that serve, uh, ladies that serve, um, uh, men and women who teach, who administrate, who show the gift of mercy and, and a consistory that meets and uh, lives into leadership. We celebrate all those things. We celebrate marriages and anniversaries and John and Beverly and their desire to do mission in a, a, a really unique way. We're grateful for all of those things. We recognize that there are those challenges, those things before us. What's life like with a loved one who is gone? How do we lean on you, Jesus, in whole new and perhaps different ways? What's it going to be like to move from a house I've lived in for a, a, a while and moving now into this, uh, this apartment with no steps? Learning where light switches are all over again or walking to a kitchen where it's a different place. Thanks that you care about those things. Uh, there's nothing too great or there's nothing too small that we can't say to you, God, hear our prayer. And so, just in this quietness of this space, as, as you run to the Father, run with a praise for a moment. Just give him thanks for something that happened this past week. We call them God hunts, right? How was a prayer answered? 
How did somebody show up and bless you? What was a Bible verse or a song that uh, God just presented to you as a gift? Run to the Father with this praise in silence for a moment. And so, Lord, those prayers uh, included such things as being blessed this morning as one lady carried in cupcakes and cookies with another. I, I saw ministry in action. I saw love in action. I saw a hug be the result of that transaction, and I praise you. And now we run to the Father with a petition. Lord, there's a marriage that's gone south. There's a spouse who has gone on to glory. There's a, a child who, who seems to be wayward. Run to the Father. Tell him your heart. And know that if suddenly you start to weep, or you're just overcome with emotions and it's like there's a mental block and you can't say the words, know that Jesus is praying for you. Experience that even now. So thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for creating this building to be the space where we can live into Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. Where we can again hear the words as it reverberates in our spirit. Come, all you who are weary and all who are heavy laden. Come, come drink from the living water that I am, says Jesus. Come eat from the living bread that I am. Know that I am your good shepherd, your guide, that I love you. So we hear those things, we hold on to those things, and we give you thanks. So if we've praised you and as we've made personal petitions, Father, we continue to pray for a healing, be it for Avis or Luetta, so many others. Verl, pray into those that find themselves in the season of grief. And we pray into this state, to our governor, to our nation. Again, we're... we're we recognize that nothing is out of your control. We recognize that you've uh, created governments to help bring about stability, but Lord, we, we recognize that we're just standing, it seems, in quicksand from changes in, in rules and applications from COVID and masks and all that kind of stuff to decisions that get made one day and then all of a sudden the city undoes the resolutions that they made. It, it just seems to be so topsy-turvy. And I guess we're saying, Lord, in the midst of that, thanks that you're an anchor, thanks that you're the refuge. Thanks that you again allow us the privilege of saying, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust our frame. We dare not trust in our leaders. We recognize, and we say that carefully, but help us to look to you. Help our leaders to look to you, to live for you, to be gracious as they live amongst this country and this world so that the name of Jesus would be lifted up and glorified. So thanks that we can have this little, little chat, Lord. It's a holy moment. We bless you for meeting us in both our time of joy and in our time of need. To you be all praise and glory now and forever. Amen and amen. Amen.
All right. How many of you are going to be glued to a TV tonight? Oh. You didn't put up your... Oh, thank you. My wife put up her hand because she just loves the closing fireworks and this, that, and everything else, and only because I'm thinking some of you really do as well. Let's think back, right? So here's Beijing closing 2008. 2012, London, England, closing ceremonies. 2016, Rio de Janeiro, closing moments, Simone Biles carrying the flag. 2020 games, now 21, ending tonight. I want to ask the question as we wrap up our short four-week series on sports in the Bible. Uh, what happens if today's the end of the race for you? Or if not today, and again, by God's grace, we get to live into some more of our tomorrows, but here, let's just say that at 60 and you're thinking of living till 70, uh, what are you going to do for these 10 years? If you're 12 and you got a baseball uh, trophy and you're thinking of becoming a parent or a grandparent, uh, how are you going to live? What happens at the end of the race? So today I just want to ask the questions and help Scripture speak into us. Today, however old you are, what are you going to do now until your final breath? And then what happens when that final breath happens? You ready? All right, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. There's a red book in the pew. Unless you brought your own Bible, pick up a Bible, hold it with the person beside you, and if you would, would you please stand? Bible in your hand. This is the book that we love because it's not the book so much that we honor. We're grateful for it, but the book speaks of the one who loves us so much, right? The book's about Jesus. Wow. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read a line. It's on the screen. You're going to read it back out loud to me. Are you ready? Here we go. This is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will learn more of the Word of God. And I will never be the same. Amen and amen. Be seated. I will have our passages of Scripture up on the screen just as uh, we can. But here's, here's where we start, right? So... No matter where we are in our age today, there's going to be a time where we're going to end the race. Finish the race of your life here on earth well. Perhaps today, if you've not made that decision, you say, okay, God, that's going to be the, uh, the ending. That's going to be the, the parade ticker tape or the uh, race tape that I break through. How do I run? What do I do? The first two texts on there, I just picked those up for a moment, right? So here, 1 Peter 4 and verse 7. So Peter, who ultimately ends up giving his life, tradition has it that he didn't want to be crucified in the same way as Jesus, his Savior and Lord, and so he asked to be crucified upside down. Wow. Wow. He's obviously at some point in his life, because you look at First and Second Peter, five chapters in 1 Peter, three in 2 Peter, and at least in 1 Peter chapter 5, you look at every of those five chapters, and there is suffering and or persecution and or denying oneself, picking up a cross, and there's some pain involved, and Peter speaks into that. And here he says, the end of all things is near. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the end of the race. Take note. Here we've got Dr. Luke, and he's writing, right? And he picks up Paul's words. 
So here's the Apostle Paul, who, again, as tradition would have it, is ended up in a Roman prison, perhaps under house guard for some two years, but ultimately, because of Roman persecution, has his head cut off. And he says, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I can finish the race. I want to complete the task that Jesus has given to me. And for him, that task was to be an evangelist, to be a church planter, right? His task was to go and start new ministries and move from town to town, from Corinth to Thessalonica to Philippi, all the way. He wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Spain. He just had this passion to be a church planter and to tell people about Jesus. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. And, and he had a story to tell in different passages that he writes in those 13 letters or 13 books that he wrote. He says, oh, by the way, I'm the chief of sinners. I want you to know that. Even though I came from a wonderful background, and he tells us about that in Philippians, how he was from the tribe, the Hebrew and the tribe of Benjamin, and he knew everything and all of that kind of stuff. But he says, let me tell you this. I was a chief sinner. I looked for Christians, I looked for people who were Christ followers, and I either threw them in jail or I had them killed, because I so wanted them not to be followers of Jesus. And then I had an encounter with Jesus. Oh my, Acts tells us, right, chapter, what is it, 8, 9, about this Damascus Road experience where the Lord speaks to him in an audible voice. Why do you persecute me? Saul! Ultimately, he has this change, gets a new name, he's now Paul, and he wants to tell people about what it is, this, this gospel of grace. I didn't deserve it. I actually killed people in God's name before I became a follower of Jesus. And in Jesus' name, let me tell you the good news. I'm transformed. I'm converted. I'm reformed. I'm changed. What God did to me, he can do to you. Wow. Wow. We don't want to forget that, right? Peter, Paul, we want to finish the race well. And sometimes we got to go, well, what does that end look like? And am I going from this spot? Am I working toward that spot? This is interesting to me. It's, it's not mine. Again, I was a artsy-fartsy, right? I graduated with a major in history and in economics, a minor in political science and geography, and then somebody sends me this, and I go, uh, at 60 nm, one degree equals nm, nm, nm. Uh, oh, yeah, nautical miles. Why do people f flying airplanes, why, why do you talk about nautical miles? Like, isn't a boat a nautical mile? Ah, this doesn't make sense to me. I turn the page. And then, all of a sudden, I get it, because somebody says, just think about one degree. Hmm, one degree, huh? Let's see. If I want to take one step forward, go exactly one foot, but I am one degree off, I'll only miss that one foot mark by 0.2 of an inch. <laughs> like, duh, I one, I'm one degree off. Did you notice? Ah, oh, no big deal. All right, so now if I want to go 100 yards, which is about the length of the football field, right? If I say, oh, I'm going to go to that goal post, but I'm one degree off, by the time I get to that goal post, I'll be five feet off. Still no big deal, right? We're not worried because we're going to be in the end zone. Like, come on. Okay, let's go longer. Let's go 5,280 feet, right? One mile. If I'm going a mile and I'm a degree off, suddenly I'm 92 feet from the mark. Whew. If I want to drive from Sioux Falls to get to the Canadian border in Manitoba, right? I'm going to take Highway 29 and go straight north. 
So for 400 miles, I'm going to go up there, and somebody's going to look it up, and it's like 408 miles. Thank you. Put your phone away. No Googling. Now, listen to me. If I go 400 miles, I, one degree off, I will miss, I, I won't get to the booth or to whatever the place is called where they let you across the border. That's like the distance between us and Parker or us and Lennox. That's how much you'll miss just in 400 miles if you're one degree off. And yeah, around here, because we're from South Dakota, I know. <laughs> if it's under 17 hours, who's flying? I'm going to drive. I'll be there tomorrow morning. I mean, that's what we say, right? All right, I know where you're coming from, so let's talk about being one degree off if you travel 240,000 miles. You want to get to the moon, do you? Okay. Be one degree off. Can you imagine all of the trouble that you go through to travel 240,000 miles and at one degree off, you'll be off by 4,000 miles. In fact, you'll be... <laughs> See ya as you float by. You never get there. So why does Paul say, uh, by the way... Uh, I want to run this race. Why does Peter say at his stage in life, uh, don't forget the end is near? Uh, why are these, these passages of Scripture about running and staying steadfast and, and, and doing, not earning salvation, but doing, why are they encouraging us to make sure that we have the end in mind? Because they don't want us to miss the mark. Hmm. One degree is a really big deal. Living a Christian life without knowing either what the mark is or what the purpose is and the race that you're running for that mark is a big deal. Our first text. Let's read it together, right? So Philippians 3, 13 and 14 together. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Whew. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward. You know what that straining forward is? Again, if you've watched any of the Olympics, the word picture is actually quite true. Did you see, uh, who's the lady's name? McLaughlin, McLaughlin right? Uh, she came in gold, uh, the 400 meter race, and, or the hurdles, and uh, the other gal was second, American. And right towards the very end, you see her? Just, uh, how do you win by a nose? Or you, you stick out your head? Straining, right? Every, every ounce of energy that you have, you strain. There's this, there's this decision as you're running the race, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to empty the tank, so to speak. And, and, and sometimes we as Christians, we're afraid to empty the tank because we understand what it is like to live in a life that doesn't seem to have plenty. And we forget the Old Testament story where wasn't it for six days out of every seven where God said, uh, I know that you don't have a Casey's, you don't have a total stop, you don't have pizzas, I, I realize that. So here, let me help you. I'll provide some, it's like coriander bread. Let, let me give you some manna. And day after day after day, he provides manna, sometimes he provides quail. I mean, God provided all the time, didn't he? They had just enough. And one of the things we have to learn is go ahead and as you strain and as you're doing what it is that you're doing, empty the tank because God will fill it again. He'll provide. We, we shouldn't live our Christian faith from this base of scarcity, but knowing that he has not just good grace, marvelous grace, amazing grace, he gives us good things, plentiful things, all things in Christ Jesus. And, and, and so as we recognize we've got to get to the tape until our last breath, strain, strain. I press on toward the goal. 
Well, let, let's do a quick survey here, right? So I'll start with Brad, and I'll work all the way back, and Amy. And what's, what's the prize of the upward goal? What, what, what are we running for, by the way? Is it a gold medal? What's, what's this prize, this upward call of God in Christ Jesus? Huh. I love these lilies. I love the stamen and, I mean, you just move it in these things, they're kind of like pivoted. The Lord created them just because he could and because they bring him joy. The Lord created you because he could, each one unique, each one absolutely different, but his call to you as you live in Christ Jesus is to what? Toward the goal for the prize. And what is the goal? I'm running my race to bring glory to Jesus Christ, the one who is absolutely worthy of it. The thoughts that I'm thinking, the actions that I'm doing, the phone call that I'm picking up to encourage somebody, the time I get on my knees to pray for my kids, whatever it might be, an act of intentional kindness, I'm running the goal to bring the glory to King Jesus. Wow. With every breath, how are we doing, church? You see, as Christians, we have this awesome responsibility, and it's a sacred privilege. It's given to us. Yes, the world can do intentional acts of kindness. Yes, there's a St. Jude. Yes, there's a, a, a foundation for multiple sclerosis or whatever it might be. We're grateful for those. But to those who are in the family of God, which we want to continue to see expand and grow, he says, are you living for your Lord and Savior? Are you recognizing his grace? Do you recognize he's given everybody a spiritual gift, 1 Peter 4.10? Do you recognize that you're in the family of God for a reason? We're not dead weight. We're not here for, for fire insurance. We want to practice loving each other because it's such a safe place. It's such a wonderful place. <laughs> Folks, we've been together for four years. You know things about me that I'm almost ashamed to even bring up. Thank you very much. I know things about you that I love to bring. No, that I won't bring up, I promise. But if this isn't a safe place to practice running the race, to have you come alongside and encourage and to send a note and, 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 and to come on over or whatever it might be, to live in community, we've lost sight of the goal. You see, every one of us, teacher said this, this, this lawyer, teacher, Jesus, tell me, what's the greatest commandment? I want to know. I think I've been doing really good, and so I got to test this, right? And Jesus says, this is what it is. Do you love my father? Do you recognize that that's the race that you're in? Do you love him? Do you love people? So let me ask the question, right? Today is 8 August. So if you can go back to last August the 8th, I'm going to ask you the question. Do people say that you love Jesus more in this last year? Do you love God? Are you running the race? Because part of the race would be, hopefully, folks would say yes, or you would say yes, again, because of God's mercy, because of the Word of God, because of the church, the bride of Christ. But do you love Him more than you did a year ago? You love people more. And, and, and while words are important, I want to hear you say yes, not right now, but can I see it? I, I know that your left hand and right hand shouldn't know what they're doing, but folks, uh, I, I do see it. From church on the street to Union Gospel Mission and Beef Booth Works and helping missionaries with this orphanage in Guatemala with Leah's kid. I'm, yeah. How are we doing? Do we love God more? Do we love people? We're making sure that we carry one another's burdens, as Paul writes in Galatians. 
And are we passing the baton? Can I tell you as a pastor, I was blown away that you kept clapping for these kids. I expected just a slight little pause. We're not really a, oh, 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 kind of get them kind of congregation. And you blew me out of the water this morning. <laughs> Good job. You're teaching your kids, you're teaching your grandkids every possible moment, right? Living into Deuteronomy 6. And you're rising up and you're going forth, you're laying down, teach kids about the Lord. Straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. Wow. So our second verse. So here's Paul. He's in prison. This is the last book he's writing. For I'm being poured out like a drink offering. It's, it's kind of like, uh, here's your last toast or what we do for prisoners, right? If you're on death row, what's your last meal going to be? It, it's, it's done, folks. There's hardly anything left in the cup anymore. The time for my departure is near, but I want to let you know I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. So here he is now, and if this is the, the, the tape, he, he's, he's that close, his chin is just touching it, he's ready to break it through. And then he says this, right? Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. So I, I've run the race, I've kept the faith, God's grace, His word, the family of God, all of that stuff. I've had trials and tribulations, I've been whipped 39 times, all of that stuff. But here I am right at the end of the race, and I'm telling you, there's something there. That it's not just, oh, I did it, but there's something that I get over and above the gift of salvation, over and above being in the presence of Christ, over and above, oh, I long for the day. Can you imagine? Oh, Brad sang that song at the funeral last time. I can hardly imagine. Will I be able to stand to my knees? Will I fall? Well, what, what, what am I going to do? And I want to be enamored by being in the presence of Christ. But I want you, from this day forward, as you recognize your last breath is going to come, you're going to get something. And I mean, it's like the kids. Why do the kids come up every Sunday? Oh, because I'm the best storyteller that there is? Nah. Because they know they'll get a candy or they'll get a trophy or a medal. Or, I, we want to instill in those kids already today not getting something for nothing, but this idea of, uh, I'm running the race. I'm going to get something. And then he says, and it's not just me who's going to get something, but now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day when I break through, when I breathe my last, when I'm standing before him. And it's not just me, but God. Can you believe it? It's going to be for all of you. Run in the race with me. Oh. Do you long for his appearing? Do you long for his coming? Do you long as you run this race with its toils and its tribulations, with its high points, mountaintop experiences, doing ministry in Jesus' name, but do you long for the fact that all of a sudden, just as you're ready to break through the tape and you look and you got people on either side, oh, what a rush. What a rush. The crown of righteousness. The crown of life. In fact, as the praise team comes up, think about this with me. If you're a student of Scripture, and by now we should be well-versed, we don't want to be drinking milk all the time. We want to eat the meat of Scripture, right? But as you start doing a word search and look through Scriptures, do you understand that the Bible speaks of five crowns that a Christian will receive? Oh, five crowns. My, oh my. So... <laughs> I don't want to be one degree off and be 4,000 miles off. I'm saying to you and to me today, the commitment on our part is either, uh, Lord, correct my stance, 
Give me the umption, the, the gumption to run the race, to strain forward, to do what you've called me to do to bring you glory in my sphere of influence as a student, as a worker, as a retiree, as a grandparent, whatever it might be. And who am I to, to think, you're the one who helps me do it. You're the one who gives me the unction to do it. You give the encouragement to do it. Uh, who am I to receive anything other than being in the presence of Jesus? And yet you're so good, you give me stuff over and above it. <sighs> give me a note. Holy, holy. Together. Holy, holy, holy. Lord, the saints adore thee. Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. Who would and art and evermore shall be. What? Archangels, cherubim, seraphim, the whole heavenly host who have never sinned? All of those created beings, a fixed number of angels, constantly, what? Falling down before the throne of the maker of heaven and earth. And look who gets to crowd them around, so to speak. The people who have sinned. The people who are forgiven. The people who've received the crown of righteousness. Because we didn't deserve it, but Christ gave it to us. And we kind of push them out a little bit to the side. And we say, I can't believe this. I can't believe it. You call me a saint. A royal priesthood, part of this nation, part of the family of God. I, I can't take this, this crown of righteousness. And you take it off and you cast it down before him and he picks it back up and he puts it back on your head and he says, I know. Receive it with grace. <sighs> What's it going to be like? You have the end in mind as you're running the race. Knowing that not only will you be in the presence of Jesus, not only in the presence of all of the angelic host, also in the presence of Hebrews 12, that great cloud of witnesses, and we all get to worship. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, I will not waste my life. If you catch me playing tiddlywinks for the next 20 years, I'll be careful. Do something with me. I want to run the race with you. And it's not all about being. It's about doing. It's about worshiping. It's about resting. It's all of that. But all to the glory of God. I want to be laser focused with you. I'll finish my course. I'll finish it well. I will display the grace of God in all that I do. Come. Let's run together. Keep it up. So, Lord, <laughs> it's sure almost awkward for us to think that as we breathe our last breath, instantly in the twinkling of an eye, you transform us, you receive us, and then when you come back again, you grant to us a, a new body. Our, our personality is the same. Our personhood, just no sin, no pain, no, uh, it's unbelievable, all of those things. And then over and above that, you give us a crown, a crown of life, a crown of righteousness. Oh, and in all of that, we have the absolute pure and unadulterated privilege of beholding our God of seeing you face to face. Oh, help us to run with that end in mind. And you've allowed us the privilege here in this service of seeing the end 
even now in the present. And so we do what we have been created to do. We say our praise be to you now and forever. Amen. Stand and sing together.
means it's not about the medals, it's not about the crowns, it's about a relationship. And our hearts here at Chancellor Reformed Church are for people to be in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Because we want them to experience what we experience. We want them to know what's at the end of the race. We want them to behold God and not be afraid. So that's our task. Let's love him, love people, make disciples. It's that simple. To him who is able to keep you from falling, from stumbling in the race. The one who picks us up, the one who encourages us, the one who keeps us going. To him be all praise and glory now and forever. Amen. James Henry is trying to work off guilt. He has cookies and coffee. Love to see you there. Go in peace.